paragraph. So Ms. Strauss will provide a presentation and we'll end it with a recommendation for, for council to consider and uh, obviously any, any questions or, or discussion after that. All right, thank you. My name is Tess Rouse, and I'm the manager of energy programs here at the Township of Langley. I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to come and speak with you regarding climate change and climate action in the township. So this past summer, Council accelerated their commitment to climate action by unanimously declaring a climate emergency. We're here today because a second motion was referred to today's CPC session. And it summarizes the following things. It asks four different things of council, and I'll just go through them in quick summary. The first is that council directs staff to establish a draft carbon budget. The second is that staff report back annually on this budget and its progress. The third is that staff prepare a presentation at a future CPC meeting further to the 2020 budget discussions in order to advance more prescriptive policies and initiatives across all departments. And the last is that council directs staff to undertake any actions, including research and investigation, with respect to best practices as action items to meet these goals. The IPCC stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's a United Nations body that provides up-to-date climate science and impacts of climate change to the global community. In October of 2018, they released this special report on global warming to one and a half degrees. And I won't go through it because it's quite lengthy, but there's three main summary items you should know about. The first is that they highlighted the difference in, in terms of impacts between one and a half degrees of global warming to two degrees. You might be thinking, half a degree, could that really have that much of an impact? Scientists state that this impact is catastrophic and that we must limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. The second is that in order to limit global warming to one and a half degrees, we have to reach the following targets. 45% emission reductions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And the last thing to note is that scientists have said this is possible to do that. However, it will take far reaching transitions in the terms of energy systems, land use, buildings, transportation, and those actions will be unprecedented in terms of scale. When we picture climate change, many of us think of polar ice caps, hurricanes on a far distant coastline, flooding, drought in desert climates, and those are all accurate depictions of climate change. However, climate change comes in many different forms and it varies in degrees of intensity. And we're feeling climate change here in Langley too, in ways of extreme weather events, like storms. What you see in front of you are a few of the projections that staff have created from local climate science and also gathering local weather data from the Langley Hospital Weather Station. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of these for you. So as I mentioned, Langley is seeing climate change through unstable weather patterns, including large storm events, with large swings in heat and cold, we're also seeing more intense precipitation, and unfortunately not when we want it, predominantly in the fall. Our summers are getting hotter and drier. Historically, we've seen maybe five days over 30 degrees annually. By 2050, this will increase to over 22 days, and by 2080, 41 days over 30 degrees. And you might be thinking, especially with today's weather, 30 degrees sounds nice right about now, but I'm not talking 30 degrees. Our hottest days are getting much hotter. We're talking 36, 38 degrees. And these extended periods of heat are gonna have major impacts on our community. Plant life, crops, on our residents, some of our most vulnerable populations, seniors, children, outside workers, and those with less income who maybe can't afford to put air conditioning in their homes. The impacts could be devastating. So with this climate science, or sorry, climate science, there's been a growing movement. There's been over 400 Canadian municipalities who have declared climate emergencies. Nine actually within the Metro Vancouver region. And thanks to the leadership of all of you, the Township of Langley joined this growing movement this past summer. 
So now that we've talked about the climate science, I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about the history of climate action here in the township. It is not a new concept for us. The township of Langley is regarded as a leader in the region in terms of green initiatives and environmental programs. What you see before you is a timeline that just highlights a few of the policy commitments and initiatives to date and some that are in stream. Over the next couple of slides, I'm just going to highlight some of these in more detail. We are the first municipality to roll out a green building rebate program whereby, whereby we incentivize local builders and developers to build to a higher energy performance than what's required of them. Since its inception, this program has seen over 200 buildings and homes successfully pass through. And we now offer a stream for existing buildings for homeowners who may want to pursue an energy efficient retrofit. The Township of Langley also adopted the BC Energy Step Code. It went live this January. It's a regulatory framework that we've embedded into our township building bylaw. As we require higher steps of this framework, the requirements for energy efficiency also increase, leading us all the way to 2032, whereby the BC Building Code will require that all new construction be net zero energy ready. And corporately, we're doing a lot as well. As a corporation, we've been carbon neutral in our municipal operations since 2014. I would like to note that this is going to be increasingly difficult in years to come due to the growing needs in our facilities as well as new facilities coming online and our growing fleet. However, we've maintained this status in part to buildings like the one we're in this afternoon, which is a LEED Silver certified building. At our new recreation center, ACUCC, this is a picture of solar, um, solar collector plates that help to preheat domestic hot water in the facility. ACUCC also has an integrated rainwater harvesting system that reduces the demand on potable water and uses rainwater to do things like flush our toilets. This September, Council unanimously passed the Low Carbon Mobility Plan, Electric Vehicles, which aims to reduce emissions from our transportation sector and support the adoption of electric vehicles. New chapters of this plan will also include things on active mobility and other technology changes. Since 2013, we've also been installing publicly accessible EV charging stations. We have eight that are currently accessible to the public and many more in stream. The township has also been a leader in the implementation of green infrastructure throughout the community. What you see pictured here is the installation of a rain garden in a new development. Rain gardens are used to help manage stormwater, protect our groundwater supply, as well as fisheries habitats. And this is now a standard practice throughout our community. In 2008, the Township of Langley was the first municipality to join in partnership with the province of BC to create the first water management plan in the province. Its aim was to provide greater control over groundwater extraction. Along with the water management plan, staff have also undertaken many other conservation measures, such as our WaterWise program. This year as well, Council unanimous, unanimously supported the implementation strategy to convert all of our existing street lights over to LEDs. Staff will be submitting the associated budget request into the 2020 budget process this year. This project alone aims to see a 50% reduction in energy usage with our street lights, as well as will result in a $380,000 savings in utility and maintenance costs. On the solid waste front, in 2011, we initiated our green can program, whereby residents can divert food scraps as well as yard trimmings. Instead of going to the garbage, they now get composted into new materials. Our diversion rate in the community is 72%. That means that whatever people put to the curb, less than 30% of it actually goes to the landfill. The rest gets recycled or composted. We also have one of the most robust corporate recycling and waste programs in the region. Every facility that we own has multi-stream receptacles. The one you see pictured here is the Langley Event Center, whereby we've partnered with the sports teams there to bring awareness around these bins so that users of, of the facility that attend events can sort their waste properly. In 2012, we also partnered with the Langley School District and modeled the same program in every elementary, middle, and high school throughout the district, the first time this had ever been done in Metro Vancouver. 
And in 2018, Council also supported the five-year phased rollout of the Public Spaces Waste Management Program, whereby bins like the one you see pictured here will be installed on most major roadways and parks so that users of our public spaces can also sort their waste properly. By the end of this year, there'll be 150 of these units installed, and by the end of the five years, close to 900. And lastly, in 2013, Township Council endorsed the Agricultural Viability Strategy that really aims to support agriculture while supporting innovative and viable production. So we've talked a lot about what we've done today and what's currently in stream. I now want to shift our focus to where we're currently at. So you'll see two charts in front of you. This data comes from an energy and emissions inventory that staff have just completed. So the graph on the left shows which sectors in the township consume the most amount of energy. You'll see buildings is leading the charge, followed closely by transportation, and then agriculture. The chart on the right shows which sectors produce the most emissions. You can see there's a lot of correlation. However, transportation wins this one, with over 54% of emissions coming from the transportation sector, followed closely by buildings. So transportation is such a large sector in emissions because of the single occupancy passenger vehicle use in our community, as well as the, as well as the commercial transportation hub that we see here, which typically utilizes heavy uh, vehicle types which have a lower fuel economy. Buildings, although they use the most energy, they don't um, emit the most emissions, and that's due to the two fuel sources that are used to heat buildings, natural gas being high in emissions, However, in BC, we have a very clean electrical grid, and that's why only 30% of our emissions come from buildings. And then thirdly is agriculture. And so emissions are produced through things like livestock, agricultural equipment, the operation of greenhouses, etc. So if there's anything you're going to take away from these two graphs, it's this. 88% of our emissions come from three fuels. Natural gas used in heating buildings, and gas and diesel used in running our vehicles. So those three fuels alone will be the top three targets for the climate action strategy that we're going to discuss in a little bit. So that's where we're at. Now we want to talk about where we're going. So this chart here shows a wedge of our emissions as of 2007, which is the last time we conducted this exercise. You can see we were just under a million tons of CO2e, which means carbon dioxide equivalent, but we'll just say emissions. And then the blue circle that you see hovering around 2017, 2019 is where we're currently at. You might be thinking, that looks like an upward trend. And we just talked about all the programs and initiatives that we're doing. So why isn't that going down? So it's a 17% increase from 2007 to present day. Without those programs and initiatives we just talked about, that increase would be much, much higher. So those projects and programs have really helped to tamper that. In the township of Langley, we're one of the fastest growing municipalities in the region. And due to that and also the rapid rate of development, our, our emissions will increase following a business as usual scenario. If we look all the way out from present day, that blue circle to 2050, you can see that upward projection continues just to where we hit over 1.8 million tons of emissions by 2050. And again, this is following a business-as-usual scenario. There is some good news. So thanks in part to legislation and policy from the provincial and federal governments, we will see some emissions reductions, even if we don't do anything different than what we're doing today. So in a very high level, the green wedge there shows a drop in emissions due to vehicle electrification and fuel improvements. I'm sure many of you have heard of the zero-emission vehicle mandate from the province, whereby all passenger vehicles by 2040 that are sold will be 100% electric. So that's what's accounted for there. The blue wedge is improvements in building energy, which includes greening of the BC building code. That's going to happen regardless of what we do. But it also takes into account the township's adoption of the BC Energy Step Code. And then the last wedge there, which drops us a little bit further, is the improvements in energy supply. So 15% of our natural gas will have to come from renewable sources by 2030, and that's been mandated by the province. So as long as these legislation and policies stay in place, township emissions are expected to decline, actually lower than we were in 2007, and that's great news. However, you can see from the gray wedge at the bottom, 
we still have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of room for local action. So we've discussed our history. We've discussed where we're currently at and where we're forecasted to go following a business as usual scenario. I'd like to talk now about where our region is forecasting to go under a different scenario. So the Metro Vancouver board this past July adopted new emission reduction targets. 45% emission reductions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Those may be familiar. Those are the same targets the IPCC is recommending. A type three minor amendment is, has currently been initiated for the current regional growth strategy to amend these targets into it. And these targets will be used in new phases of the regional growth strategy as well. The higher the degree of alignment between the region and local governments, the more likelihood it will be that we can actually achieve these targets and limit global warming to one and a half degrees. So with that in mind, staff have modeled what it would look like for the Township of Langley to hit those same targets. So the first blue circle there indicates where we would need to drop our emissions to in order to meet that 2030 target. And then all the way up to 2050, and you can see emissions at zero. That's where we'd need to get to. As an example, to meet the 2030 proposed targets, Township of Langley emissions would need to drop 500,000 tons in the next 10 years. That's 10,000, or sorry, that's 50,000 tons per year. So for context, approximately 50,000 tons of emission reductions could be achieved by 7% of current trips taken by vehicle over to active modes of transportation like walking, cycling, electric transit, replacing 15,000 current vehicles on our roads with zero emission vehicles, or the replacement of 11,000 naturally gas furnaces with electric heat pumps. There's a, a wide variety of combinations of actions that could be used to meet those targets. Those are just a sample of some, just so you can all understand the magnitude of action that's required to meet these targets. So concurrently to Council's declaration of the climate emergency, staff have also been developing the climate action strategy which will pull together a comprehensive set of actions that will align the township with meeting the targets that the region has adopted. And that will also help to create a more resilient community that can adapt in the face of our changing climate. In more detail, the climate action strategy will form a unified document built upon both mitigation and adaptation. What do those mean? So mitigation is the proactive response to climate change. It really looks to lower emission reductions across all sectors and can be done through actions such as compact, mixed-use communities, active transportation, electric vehicles, high-performance buildings. Adaptation is a responsive approach to climate action and really looks at how to lower the risk to our community in the face of our changing climate. And that can be accomplished through also a variety of actions, such as protecting our groundwater, emergency preparedness, reducing our risk of flooding. So the climate action strategy will bring together actions from the three plans you see along the bottom, our corporate energy and emissions plan, our community energy and emissions plan, and our adaptation plan. We'll focus on pulling together the targets, visions, goals, and actions into one strategy. So as part of the Climate Action Strategy Development, staff hosted a public climate action event on November 5th. We had over 100 attendees come out that night, including members of council. And it was very evident from this event that this is an issue that our community does care about and expects us to take action on. We surveyed attendees that evening with poster boards, polling sessions, and we got a number of different ideas from them on what they'd like to see us do in terms of climate action. I'm just going to share a few of those with you. These are the top five that came from that evening. I'll just read them quickly. Review and revise the official community plan, zoning and building bylaws, and neighborhood and community plans under the umbrella of a climate crisis. Build a complete network of separated bike lanes. Electrify all buildings. Require water metering to promote water conservation and stricter regulations for pollution and construction to protect environmental areas. 
So along with public engagement, staff have also been dilig diligently working with staff across all departments from every division here in the township to pull together plausible actions that could align us to meet these 2030 and 2050 targets. And while we're still in the infancy of this action planning, a number of priori priority areas have emerged for us, seven in fact. So I'm gonna walk through each of them and talk about what the intent or goal would be behind each of these areas. So the first is zero emissions mobility. Make walking, cycling, and transit preferred transportation options and transition to zero emission vehicles. Zero emission buildings require all new buildings to be zero emissions, energy efficient, and climate resilient, and radically increase zero emission retrofits and resiliency in existing buildings. Zero waste, foster the transition to a zero waste community by maximizing waste reduction, reuse, and recycling. A thriving agricultural industry, produce local food with sustainable and innovative practices, and ensure agriculture is thriving and diverse with a focus on serving local markets. Resilient natural environment and water resources, enhance natural assets, increase biodiversity, and conserve resources through resilient and adapt adaptive management practices. Resilient and green infrastructure, support the development and maintenance of green infrastructure and naturalized areas to improve resilience. And lastly, renewable energy innovation and leadership. Support the development of local and renewable energy systems and emerge as a regional leader in sustainable and innovative practices. And just really quickly, I wanna highlight some of the big moves from other local governments who have also declared climate emergencies and are in the process or have developed climate action strategies. And these all relate to the emerging priority areas that we just spoke about. So the city of New Westminster, the city will prioritize climate emergency initiatives over other non-climate related priorities in the five-year financial plan, including the reallocation of capital where necessary. City of New West again, 60% of all trips will be made by sustainable modes of transportation, walking, transit, bicycling, zero emission vehicles by 2030. From City of Vancouver, by 2030, 50% of all kilometers driven on Vancouver roads will be by zero emission vehicles. And the City of Surrey, City of Delta, and Samyamu First Nation actually created a partnership to develop a flood adaptation strategy whereby they will be building and rehabilitating 13 infrastructure assets. Through this strategy, they've actually been given $76 million in federal funding to replace or rehabilitate things like bridges. The city of West Vancouver just completed this project as well that also relates to climate adaptation, natural asset valuation project, whereby they evaluated natural assets like grasslands, wetlands, waterways, forests. The value of those natural assets came to approximately $2.17 billion. And now staff are working to integrate this into their asset management program and financial planning. City of Vancouver and the City of New Westminster have both committed to, to this big move. All new and replacement heating and hot water systems will be zero emissions. In most cases, that means a heat pump instead of a furnace. City of New West, create people-centered public realms. They're actually going to reallocate 10% of the existing street space to serve only sustainable modes of transportation and create public gathering spaces by 2030. And lastly, the city of Vancouver, who's committed to a rain city strategy, which will capture and clean 90% of their rainfall through the implementation of green infrastructure, rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs. So in front of you is the project timeline for the climate action strategy. As I mentioned, we're currently identifying possible actions through comprehensive internal engagement. Once a refined set of actions is ready, we will then model these actions to see what their impacts are in terms of reducing our emissions in the community and also evaluate them for their impact towards increasing the township's climate resiliency. 
Staff are proposing that in mid-2020, we come back to Council with a draft climate action strategy for your consideration, at which point we'll also be asking you to support comprehensive public engagement on the draft strategy so that we can further refine the actions and implementation plans for them. After that refinement phase, we would then present a final climate action strategy to Council at the end of next year. The Climate Action Strategy will be a significant undertaking that transects across all departments and divisions and really changes the way that we do business here as an organization. There is a need to provide funding for these climate action projects so that we can get going on them as soon as possible and also take advantage of the grants and incentives that are currently available through the province, the federal government and the utilities. While detailed costing is not yet available for specific actions, if the Climate Action Strategy is endorsed by Council, staff will work to develop detailed implementation plans, policies, and funding strategies for each action. We can't say yet what the costs are going to be, but what I can say with a high level of confidence is that the cost of inaction will be significantly higher. Part of the second motion was for Council to direct staff to establish a carbon budget. I'm going to tell you what a carbon budget is, but before we get to that, rest assured, staff are integrating the principles of carbon budgeting into the draft climate action strategy for your consideration. As I mentioned, staff have already completed an energy and emissions inventory. Staff are currently gathering plausible actions to meet those reduction targets. We will then model out their impacts and present that within certain time frames. A carbon budget at a very high level really just talks about the maximum amount of carbon that can be emitted into the atmosphere before we pass the point of rising temperatures one and a half degrees. And that amount of carbon or budget of carbon can be scaled down to the country level, province, municipality, and even by sector. And so staff will propose a, a carbon budget model within the climate action strategy for your consideration. Staff have two recommendations for you. The first is that Council adopt new greenhouse gas emission reduction targets of 45% emission reductions by 2030 and 100% emission reductions by 2050. And that staff be authorized to identify funding requests related to climate action as part of annual budget processes. And I will close with this. Climate change is not an environmental problem. It never has been. It's a societal one. It's a societal problem in that climate change undermines the ecological systems on which we rely. Everything we have built, whether it be agricultural systems, transportation corridors, hard infrastructure, business communities, they all requ require a relatively stable, stable conditions to operate normally. And the impacts we are seeing will not just impact natural systems. We have and we will continue to see impacts socially and economically within our community. We will continue to see volatility in energy prices, poor air quality, extreme weather events, political pressure. And with the township's pace of growth and rapid development, we may lose the ability to sustainably plan for it. Right now, we have an opportunity we're not fully built out. Our population has not doubled yet. And so really, it's our chance to get ahead of it. The Climate Action Strategy can transition the township to a healthier, more resilient, sustainable, and affordable future. And has, as, climate has, or sorry, as science has said, business as usual is no longer an option. Now is the time for bold, unprecedented action. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Do we have any um, questions or? Oh, right here. Councillor Whitmarsh. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very comprehensive and uh, really good information. I appreciated the, the uh, information there. Um, I had a, a few questions um, with this. And uh, one, one was, um, uh, when you talk about putting together a carbon budget for the township, does that include um, in the, in a carbon budget sort of the the additional costs uh, to 
to uh, buildings or to uh, roadways, um, for example, accommodating a separate separated bike path, which was one of the things you'd mentioned. Does that include the the increased cost of those kinds of things when you talk about a carbon budget? What what does that mean? Not exactly, no. Uh, so a carbon budget, as I mentioned, talks about the allowable amount of emissions that we can emit before we pass that certain threshold, right? And so that amount of carbon gets scaled down via city. So the township has a certain amount of emissions in order to meet that, that 2030 and 2050 target. However, as part of the carbon budget, we would need to address what actions can get us to meet those targets. And therefore, in what you're asking, we are trying to provide financial strategies and cost implications to each of those actions. So that would be part of the draft strategy. Right. Okay. So that's helpful. So we, we have a carbon budget, which outlines sort of the budget and the level of emissions we have. And then we have a budget, which outlines a financial budget, which outlines the cost to accomplish that. That's correct. Um, okay. That's helpful. So the, the idea of reducing emissions by 100% by 2050, I'm not sure I'm grasping it entirely. Maybe just sort of explain it a bit more for me. The um, it, it, may, it seems to make seem that we want to reduce by 100%, which means to zero. Mm -hmm. So zero emissions from buildings, from uh, vehicles, from all those things. Is that, a, is that a reasonable target to expect from all of our buildings and all of our vehicles in 30 years from now? Good question. Um, there is technologies there to make buildings right now zero emissions. There's also obviously electric vehicles, active mobility to get people out of their cars to transition transportation to zero emissions. When we say that, it's really at a high level just for simplicity. Typically, a city can reduce almost to zero. And what cannot be reduced down typically is offset through projects like carbon sequestration or offset projects in other parts of the world. So typically you'll see us, or cities, get all the way almost to zero, but then there is going to be a small wedge left until technology catches up that we'd have to offset in other ways. Right, okay. So this isn't just for new buildings or new vehicles. This is for even existing buildings, converting them to become zero emission. That's correct. And actually, that's the bigger problem. Yeah, for Typically, sure. how we like to phrase it is new construction or buying a new vehicle is really just stopping the bleeding. Yes. But we have a lot of work to do for what's already here. For what's and, already here. Yeah, yeah very good point. Uh, one other question I had was uh, um, just re not, not too long ago, recently, the, uh, our, our new uh, federal government um, sort of committed to the idea of planting two billion trees uh, in Canada over the next decade. Um, it was suggested by the uh, Green Party that that wasn't near enough, that it should be 10 billion trees um, over the next decade. Do we have any um, uh, information about how many trees we plant uh, totally in a, in a given year here in the township? Do we? I mean, you may not know that off the top of your head, but would we have information about the number of trees we plant on an annual basis here in the township? I defer to Raman for that one. Uh, Madam Chair, the answer is yes, we do. We, we, we keep a, a, a very accurate record, record of all the, the trees that we plant, whether through the development approval process or whether uh, as part of the capital budget process. Okay, so uh, we don't need that here today, but that is something that we could get and we could find out sort of what our plan would be over the next decade in the township of Langley in terms of tree planting. Absolutely. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Councillor Arneson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for uh, what you've given us today in terms of your presentation. I know that you're just covering um, the thinnest layer of what you actually do and how much you've actually thought about this process. And so I do appreciate, um, I call it the condensation of this, to touch upon, I think, the important local government elements. Um, one of the things I've always said, and appears to be true, because more people are saying it these days, this is the most important layer of government. We're actually under-resourced and underfunded, but we have the capacity in our toolkit to do so much, and particularly around climate change, because most of these activities take place within our local community. And so I really appreciate the opportunity that we've been given to look uh, more concretely at what our activities are and find ways actually to um, promote climate action through them. So I just want to touch upon a couple of points that you mentioned. Um, 
So the first one, well, actually, first of all, I should get this out of the way. <laughs> I have a petition that I have here that's been signed by some local residents who are very keen to see us move forward. So I'm going to hand that to the clerk afterwards uh, as part of the public record. Um, and it's interesting, though, that the preamble to their petition really is exactly more or less what the recommendations are that you're bringing to council, that we adopt the targets of the 45% emission reductions by 2030 and 100% by 2050, and also uh, that you're, well, the other part, that you're authorized to identify funding requests. That's really an important consideration. I know that there's lots of funding options that are becoming available, and that's something that staff has to be aware of and, and deal with as we go forward, because many of these things could be uh, partnered with other levels of government. Um, my question element has more to do with the timeline, I guess, of this strategy, and I'm trying to compromise in my own mind the abilities of staff to, first of all, get um, authorization to move forward with this, then put together a comprehensive plan, then to get the engagement, etc. It's just challenging from my perspective that if we're already in a mode where we know that there is a very critical time frame in which we need to take action, then in fact we are by default, delaying action in that sense. Can you give us any comfort that some of these things are already going to be contributing to our climate action plan without, you know, the formal assessment of it all? I, I think what I'm trying to say is what you're suggesting will go above and beyond what we're already doing and will take a lot of community buy-in, but just that uh, degree of um, comfort that we know that we're proceeding at a fairly good pace. <coughs> Yeah, no, the sustainability department does not get a vacation until the strategy is endorsed. We are we are um, continually trying to advance a number of projects. We have a number of budget requests within the 2020 budget that will continue um, our movement towards uh, the climate action strategy, uh, as well as really the climate action strategy looks to really accelerate some of the actions and plans that have already been endorsed by council. Included with that would be our corporate energy and emissions plan, which was adopted in 2016, um, as well as a number of the other initiatives that we're already doing, included in the low carbon mobility plan that was adopted in September. Oops, sorry about that. Um, I also know from being on the Climate Action Committee that the township is spearheading a analysis of um, how to do deep, I'm going to call them deep retrofits for the heat pumps. And I certainly think that across the region in particular, all other communities are looking at us and that information because we have a lot of buildings that are not being built to the step code standards, like any standard maybe, or step one, but they're going to be in existence for a long time. And how to ensure, firstly, that buildings are available to be retrofitted, and secondly, how do we make that economically viable for individuals? Can we incentivize that with partners in some way, you know, to make sure that we're doing the right thing for buildings that will be lasting uh, for many, many years, and also you know, energy conservation and uh, savings that can be achieved over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a partnership program actually with um, the Township of Langley, the City of Vancouver, and a number of other local governments. So we've hired a consultant to really target industry as to how we could target existing homes and reduce the emissions within them by things like changing over their heating systems to heat pumps, um, added insulation, better windows, all of those. So the, the, the goal of that project is to come up with a retrofit package that would radically increase the deep low carbon retrofits within existing homes. I have another question. I'm not sure if it's something that you could come up with um, any detailed information at this time. But I'm just wondering, for the existing plans that we have, like the green building rebate, is there any way for staff to calculate what percentage of greenhouse gases those kind of buildings would represent in our overall picture? Yes, we do. So the Green Building Rebate Program, which is based uh, on the STEP code, the, the BC Energy STEP code, really does target energy efficiency in homes, which is obviously very important. That's typically where you'd see a reduction in your operating costs for your heating systems. Uh, but it doesn't inherently actually target greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something uh, that a number of local governments are working on right now, is which to come up with almost a sister code to the STEP code uh, that really looks at targeting greenhouse gas limits in new 
new construction, as well as how that could be transferred over to existing homes as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Richter. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and I apologize for my lateness today, but you certainly got my vote on this, and I want to move the recommendations. Uh, I did have some questions, though. Uh, with regards to the first one, that it says adopt targets of 45% uh, emission reductions by 2030. That's 45% emission reductions from what, and should that be specified in here? Um, yeah, it's usually specified from 2010 levels. From the 2010 yeah. levels. Okay, so we can add that in. And also with regards to the second one, the funding requests related to climate action, um, what kind of budget um, requirements are you anticipating at this stage? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, we've submitted a number of budget requests for the 2020 budget, which will be coming before council shortly. Uh, so in terms of new funding that would be required, we're requesting 725000 in capital and 300000 in operating. And that spans a number of different projects that are already been developed and, and implementation strategies have been refined for those. Okay. Um, also, a member of this council has expressed concern over the number of trees that are being planted. Do we keep track of the number of trees that are being cut every time we approve a development proposal? Raman is saying yes, we do. We do? Okay. And can we get a copy of that record sometime? Yes, you can. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, with the chair's permission, I'll move the recommendations with uh, um, with a correction to the first one or, or um, amendment to the first one. Um, I think that there, we still have a few more people that would like to uh, that have questions. So, should I go through the speaker list first? Okay. So we have. Um, are you finished, Councillor Richter? Yep. Should I move on? Okay. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Oh, yeah, thank you. And um, we always like to see fresh young faces come forward, but uh, uh, thank you <laughs> for young Phil. I'm, I'm not, and I'm going to say uh, I'll see more on there. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Must be getting, I need more coffee. Okay, um, you know, where we're at today, you know, and I, you know, don't want to forget, you know, you know, our past. Right, and I really, I almost come to a point where I have to almost lecture myself and others. Is you know, uh, we introduced recycling, and the region has years and years and years ago. And um, regardless of that, re introducing recycling, we, you know, we still have a problem in our society with people throwing garbage out the window, people not picking up cigarette butts, and people, if you walk down any street, leaving you know debris everywhere. We still have that problem within a uh, 21st century society. Um, I, our family adopts a street. We go out and pick up garbage, and you know, pe that people we don't understand why it would happen would throw out their window or, or leave on an ongoing basis. So education is some, something that's out there. As a teacher, I taught for a number of years. Uh, uh, we used to clean up the schoolyards on a regular basis. I mean, these are all information. It's all uh, almost incomprehensible under the society we live in that you know that still is a number one concern and uh, we have huge commitments to our uh, solid waste so the next and then we will then we're going to skip into recycling we still have to educate people how to recycle properly again if you drive down the lanes or alleys of metro vancouver not just langley you will see people strewing paper and uh, recycling in incorrectly not doing their green again education so here we are there and the last thing of course my my wife and i are big thrifters you know we move things around we recycle clothes we do other things again that generates again to the clothing industry is a huge use of water and other things as you know you're aware so these are all things I sit on a liquid waste committee. People flushing rags and other debris down their toilets puts a huge infrastructure problem on our major sewage treatment plants. In fact, it could jam the uh, rotors that, that run the plants, and that's hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair. Again, that's education. So here we are today talking about things which are extremely important, but we don't want to lose sight of the fact there's still minor problems that aren't being addressed even today. So I know we still have to, it's not your fault to do that, but no, and my last thing, trees. You know, the minute anybody in this world puts up a tree in an area in a, in a forest, Boree rainforest, 
you know, uh, you put a dwelling up, you're going to have to cut trees down. And the reality, once you cut one tree down, then sometimes, you know, two, three more have to come down and it affects the forest and things like that. So that's another concern. I imagine, you know, if we want to protect trees, I think we have to replant them and sometimes we can't plant the same trees that were the existing there. Also, as, as we all know, uh, trees that have been there for a while, the long uh, the, the large and tall trees can be, uh, uh, their branches are not maintained properly, the branches can come down. And you see that in Brookswood area, an area which I live in, uh, any windy day. When it, those big winds, as you talk about the climate change, big winds come up, they knock down these branches and they're all over the road. And, you know, again, these are other things that we have to prepare for as we look for the 21st century as we go on. So, I thank you for all the things you're doing. I support this, but I don't want us to fall short of the fact that there's still existing minor front-line thing, front things that have to be addressed. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, um, Councillor Woodward. Yeah, thanks for that. I won't, I see we're running out of time here, so I won't uh, ask too many questions. What's the need for number two? Since you're already doing that for 2020, it seems like you can just do that. Why do we need to specifically authorize you? Yeah, so... Madam Chair, perhaps I can take a stab at yeah. this question, and then t Thanks, if, I, if I leave anything out, uh, uh, Tess can, can, can assist with the details. Uh, as Councillor Woodward has referenced the, and, and discussed previously, uh, staff is, has included uh, a number of uh, items for Council's consideration as part of the budget process in 2020 and beyond. Uh, the need for this is essentially to, I guess, if you will... Uh, specifically identify each one or flag them as you will, uh, such that council can elevate them if they need, if uh, if need be, or if uh, at, at council's discretion. Because sometimes some topics or some items may not meet the or may not, uh, yeah, meet the the actual cap, if you will. The envelope available for for each one of the utilities, for example, may see some of these items falling below the line where the funding available. Uh, allows them to actually be funded. So this would uh, actually enable us to identify them such that council can uh, elect to, if they so choose, rise or raise each, each item uh, to be above the, uh, the, the, the line. So just so I can clarify that, Mr. Sevi, do, do I, am I interpreting that correctly, suggesting that there will be some combination on an annual basis which are inside the funding envelope based on number two? Is that, is that how I should interpret that? Uh, that's correct. As you know, staff already goes through a, a prioritization process as we prepare our budget or the budget requests that are then presented to the council for consideration. Uh, those uh, relate essentially to uh, health and safety issues, legislation that requires us to do certain things or take certain, certain actions, or whether a specific request for funding allows us to uh, leverage or, or acquire or obtain a grant or be successful in a grant application. So those types of criteria already go into our submissions to council, uh, and sometimes some of these items that that uh, Ms. Rouse has identified as totaling approximately $1 million or thereabouts may not meet any of those ob objectives or criteria. So we're just uh, highlighting uh, that we will, with Council's authorization, identify those, those regardless of where they might fall within the, the budget envelope or outside. Helpful. Thank you. Number one, you mentioned 45% from 2010. Mm -hmm. What would the percentage be from 2020? From 2020 level? Or 2019, doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so the problem with that, and, and I actually didn't make that an error, so 2010 is the base here that Metro Vancouver has adopted in the IPCC. The last time we did this emissions inventory was 2007, so we'd actually be recommending 45% 40, emission reductions by 2000 and, or under 2007 levels. The reason we haven't proposed 2019 or 2020 levels is just because of the availability of data. Uh, so typically the CEI, which is the Community Energy and Emissions Inventory released by the province, only comes out every three to four years. So 20, 2007 and then 2017 were the last years in which we had a full, complete set of data. So then can I ask about the percentage from the 2017 levels? I'm trying to get, yeah. tell you where I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to get to an understanding of what the reductions are from what we're producing today, not what we were producing 12 years ago. 
Yeah, so from today, um, we would be looking at a 45% reduction from 2017 um, levels under 2007. So that would be 500,000 tons of CO2. Now you're confusing me. So you're saying it's from 2017, but you're using 2007? I'm not understanding it. Sorry, so 2007 is just our base here. So it's 45% emission reductions from the 2017 emissions inventory, which is the most current emission inventory we have, compared to 2007 levels. Okay, so it's 45% from 2017 then? Yes, compared to 2007 as our base year. Okay, so, yeah, you're going to, I'm sorry, I'm just not, you're going to have to walk me through this again. Sure. Because 45% emission reductions by 2030, so council adopts targets, 45% emission reduction by 2030, but we wouldn't have any understanding of what we're committing to. So it's, Or at least I wouldn't, I'll speak for myself. It, yeah, it's a, so it's a, maybe the that chart there. So I can grab the mouse again. So here in 2017, this is where we're saying we're currently at, so which is about 1.5 million tons of emissions. Okay. So we want to reduce this 45% in, rel in relation to 2007 levels by 2030, bringing us to about here. Okay, so maybe I could at some point when it was close to council, I could get the percentage from the 2017 level to the target level. Sure. Like Rather very... than this 45% from 2007, which I think is a bit confusing me. Because as I've grown up and this uh, climate change issue continues, mm -hmm. how many you know, world conferences have we witnessed where politician after politician after politician sets targets and never meets them? Right. Um, and so I don't want to be one of those politicians. And so what I'm trying to do is avoid becoming one of those politicians. Um, so how do I get a grasp over the exact percentages, the volume, and how we're going to achieve that target before I endorse the target? Okay, yeah, so we can definitely go in that into more detail. I guess um, how Metro has adopted the targets and how we're proposing is that it's a 45% reduction from 2017 compared to 2007 levels. And so that, that percentage, that 45%, would equate out to approximately we'd need to drop our emissions by 500,000 tonnes in the next 10 years. Just to draw a comparison, we need to drop our current emissions by half. Exactly. Close enough? Yep plus or minus, yeah. that seems challenging in 10 years, especially for us growing at the rate that we're growing and that we're largely a greenfield-based development municipality, say versus other like New Westminster, which are infill-based, right? They're going up, they're not going out. We're mm -hmm. going out, and that we're also going to be expected to keep pace with some of these other municipalities. So it would be nice to have some, rather than just say New West is doing a great job, maybe it's easier for them to do a great job and, and understand it maybe in a regional context rather than simply saying, you know, we're going to look at it in a vacuum and achieve this, which may be much more costly and much more challenging for a greenfield-based municipality to achieve. Yeah, if, if I may comment. Great, um, yeah, any feedback you have. So how, how, what scientists have stated is that these are the only targets globally that have to be met. So every city needs to meet these in order to limit global warming to one and a half degrees. And I understand your concern that we are growing. We're one of the fastest growing municipalities. Our rate of development is unprecedented. But instead of looking at that as a negative thing, I, I, I challenge you all to look at that as an actual opportunity. We aren't fully developed. We have not seen the population growth that other municipalities have had. It's actually more cost effective and Somewhat, there's more opportunity here to do it now than to wait till we're fully built out like some of the other municipalities are now facing where they have to do, for example, within their building sector, retrofitting those buildings to reduce emissions is much more costly and much more difficult than just putting in new restrictions for new construction. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. I didn't view it as a positive or a negative. I just viewed it as a, as a factual context as right. I perceive it versus another municipality that can take a 30-story tower and make it the most energy-efficient tower ever built and put, you know, I don't know how many residents in there, let's say 1,000, just to keep the numbers simple, whereas us, we're not doing that. We're putting 1,000 people in 500 townhouses. And so we're going to have a harder time than someone like New Westminster, and I just think it's important to keep that in mind. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, sure, yes. recommendations uh, with the inclusion or amendment of uh, emission reductions from 2010 levels just to make 2007 it. levels 2007 <laughs> levels okay uh, yeah. by 2030 do we have a seconder councillor Arneson 
and we open it up for discussion. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Woodward. Oh, I don't. My mic's not on. So. Thank you. So, just on the motion, how do we? I mean, I I want to support it, but I also want to know what we're looking at to achieve 45 percent emissions before endorsing a target. So I don't repeat myself. I don't turn into one of these politicians that just sets targets and has no plan to actually meet them. So what is the plan to meet the target prior to endorsing the target? I'd, and if I, if nobody else agrees with that, I'll let it go. But I don't don't understand. Well, I, I don't want to end up like, uh, what was the first one in Brazil when I was in high school? I'm not sure. With Brian Mulroney, <laughs> where they were going to solve climate change and George Herbert Walker Bush. So again, targets were made and targets weren't kept because there wasn't a realistic plan to achieve them before they were endorsed. Right. Um, if I may comment, um, typically the way we've, we've um, created targets with plans related to the environment in, in the past have been to create the action plan and then to calculate out where that gets us to. Um, and in the face of climate action and the climate emergency, local governments are, are taking a different approach where based on climate science, we're setting the target where we're trying to get to and we're backcasting from there. We're working backwards to say, if that's where we need to get to, what type of action, at, at what time scale do we need to get these things done in order to meet those targets? So hearing your concern, it's absolutely valid and that's why we're trying to create this comprehensive action plan to meet those targets. However, it would be nice to have a signal that we are going in the right direction so that we know what we're aiming for. Okay, and I'll just, I'll just add for the debate. I mean, I think I'm going to support it. I'm, I'm not going to be saying no to establishing targets and trying to meet them, but I, I do find it, you know, without any idea of what it's going to cost or how it's going to be achieved prior to endorsing it, it just it seems a little bit reversed to me, but I understand your logic. Thanks. We have another question from Councillor Whitmarsh. Um, it's not really a question. It's just oh. a comment uh, with regard to... Uh, the motion and uh, number two, I, I you know, I, I uh, certainly understand uh, Councillor Woodward's concern about not necessarily having the plan in front of us of how we're going to get there. But I do, I do like the idea of having a target uh, for it. I think the setting a target allows them to set the plan uh, in this case, and this is a target that uh, everyone else is sort of agreeing to around the world and around uh, Canada. So I think this is good to have that target. I think it pro I'm assuming that there will be a plan put in place, what the cost will be, and th those kinds of things will come back to council in some form um, that we'll be able to have some continued discussion along with that. But I think they need to have know what the target is, and, and us making that decision today is helpful. I'll move to extend, Madam Chair, five or ten minutes to finish this up, if you like. You don't need a motion for that? Just keep going? Okay. Oh, okay, right. Yes, we're at one. Okay, so we don't need a motion. Okay, so should we call? Is it? Do I call the vote? To okay, so call the vote. Oh, show of hands. All in favor? And it carries unanimously. Oh, oh, we have uh, something. Yes, a request from Councillor Arneson. Yeah, no, it wasn't divided. Thank you. Um, but further to the earlier division, I just want to make sure I've uh, sought some instruction prior to the meeting. And so it's not self-evident uh, that the original motion, which has, if you will look at it, motion, uh, the second portion that was referenced by Councillor Woodward, motion number two, and the talk about the carbon budget and the timelines, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that that's actually endorsed by Council and moves forward to staff um, because it is not necessarily, it doesn't follow that just because we're saying yes to these recommendations that we are endorsing that part. And I think that part is very important to the entire conversation for the reasons that Mr. Safey mentioned. So I, I just want to move part number two also be forwarded to staff by council resolution. Any discussion? Just to pause for a oh. moment. So what we've effectively done is this is a council committee of the whole is we've made the first recommendation back to council. So the first recommendation will go back to a subsequent council agenda. What Councillor Arneson is now saying is that on the bottom of page uh, three of the agenda, on the top of page four, we have the items that were previously moved and seconded at the council table that were referred to the CPC session. Councillor Arneson is effectively recommending to council through her motion that these therefore be adopted. 
Just okay, so I'll seconds. open that up for discussion. Uh, Councillor Whitmarsh. Uh, no, no, uh, oh, okay. So, Councillor <laughs> Councillor Froze, Mayor Froze. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I'm quite uh, happy with the motion that we just passed. I, I don't think this one is necessary. I haven't really prepared for this one. Uh, the whole intent of the CPC meeting was to hear just what we heard, and and uh, the that was the motion that went to uh, that council made to go to CPC to hear this presentation. So. I'm not prepared to support this this time. I think we've done a lot. We're moving forward, and by I guess obviously, if I say no to this, everybody thinks I'm against climate change. But I'm not. I'm totally for it. But this is not the right time to do this. Thanks, Councillor Woodward. Uh, yeah, I, I, my mic's not on. Not sure. Oh, you just push it. Thanks. There we go. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I read this. I think I'm happy to rather than endorse this. Um, refer it, to continue the discussion at CPC to specifically on carbon budget. So as an element of the strategy, either explaining to us that it's going to be incorporated or it, part of the strategy coming forward next year or what role this might have in terms of the staff having a look at that specifically at a future CPC and us discussing it specifically. I don't, I don't want to support or not support it without having heard from the staff and getting a bit more information about what the intent is here and we're running out of time to do that properly. So I'd like to defer the, or continue the conversation at a, at a subsequent I'll, I'll CPC that, meeting. Madam Chair. Okay, so, all right. Okay. Any, any questions? Councillor Ferguson? That was it. Are we that was looking it? Okay. at the referral right now? Okay. So I will call the question. I'm, so we're re, uh, the the motion is to refer this to another CPC meeting. What about my original motion? That's what's being yeah, so, Madam Chair, just to, to <laughs> just to, I know we're I know we're tight for time, but okay. just slow down for one moment. The motion two that's on the agenda I think has four parts. Um, I think what we can establish is that the presentation to a future CPC has now been established. Um, so we're really talking about parts one, two, and four. Is that correct, Councillor Arneson? No, okay. Right. 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 It is premature to be looking at that, but already today we had further discussion about a carbon budget, the only thing that we haven't identified as a cost, but we don't. There's lots of things that we say yes to. We don't know the exact cost. We do it because we know it's a good idea. So I think it's safe to say that all of these things are appropriate and best practices under the circumstances. So I don't agree with deferring this because I don't know then when it's going to be discussed. Um, you know, we've already delayed on this for 30 years. I can't underline that enough. And for those who don't maybe think that it's a really big crisis, I think that that's wrong. And I think that it is prudent um, I will quote staff, either do it now or do it later, but later is going to cost a lot more. That's paraphrasing. So I think that it is unfortunate if we're going to take a let's delay approach and base that on, well, we're not exactly sure what the implications to the budget would be because I don't know that that's a really good rationale for why we shouldn't be allowing staff to move forward in a very holistic and comprehensive way in the manner in which we're going to eventually have to consider these. Of course, they're difficult numbers. If it was easy, we would have done it a long time ago, but I'm, I'm not supporting sending this to CPC. I think we need to do it now. Thank you, Councillor. My, my question, though, is more specific, and, and that was uh, there's four parts to the motion number two uh, that's being suggested for deferral, but I believe there may, may only need to be three parts. Uh, the first part is referring to a carbon budget. The second is reporting back annually. The third was to prepare a CPC presentation, and the fourth then was the undertake any actions, including research and investigation with respect to best practices. My, my question is, as part of your motion, is item three therefore redundant by the presentation we saw today? Oops. 
Oh, let me get your question. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Backen, for your clarification. That's very true because we, at that time, did not have the presentation today. So you could strike out that language. I don't think it's going to help the, uh, the motion any, but, um, yeah, that would be true. That would be redundant at this point. And just for clarity purposes, the deferral to a subsequent CPC is of 1, 2, and 4. That will be then be proceeding. Okay, we have... Um, is it, are you good, Councillor Arneson? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have Councillor Long that we'd like to speak. Ah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad that was clarified because it was getting a little confusing for me over here too um, because item three, we certainly have had a great discussion about item three already. So, But we've also touched on items one, two, and four in this presentation. So maybe it'd be interesting to find out what the next steps would normally be um, because it has to come back to council anyway before, I mean, certainly the CPC are going to recommend that it comes back to council. That's the motion that we voted on and passed. But would it not come back with one, two, and, and four also come back to council uh, kind of wrapped up with what we've discussed today? Because it's not going to be as clear, I don't think, when the motion that we've passed to bring it back to council, right, motion one and two that we looked at earlier um, that was passed isn't, isn't really clear cut on what is what's you know it's, it does say we're going to advance and 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 do the 45 percent and all that but would it not also come back with some of these items and i'm just trying to say it may not require uh, another cpc meeting but it could require a bigger and a better not better but a bigger and a more in-depth discussion when it comes back to council including these items it may have by implication included some or all of these components uh, the process however we're at right now is we have the previous two resolutions recommended by the committee to council uh, those have, have been uh, have been uh, adopted or, refer or passed along uh, councillor arneson then made the motion to deal with these four items now three items independently and the motion on the table is to defer these to a future cpc meeting again there may be some crossover by implication but these are now live topics because of the okay. uh, motion in so the i would think that if I supported the motion, which I'm going to, I think, that those one, two, and four would come back along with motion one and two when it comes back to council. And that would give us an opportunity, I think, at that point to defer it if need be for more information, to discuss it further, or to even divide, or even to come up with new recommendations, right? Substantively, you're likely correct, but the challenge we have is procedurally items one, three, and four are now on the table. I'm looking for a destination. They one, could two, be and four. One, two and four, they, they could be referred to council, which was the original motion. However, now there's an intervening motion to refer or to defer these to a subsequent CPC meeting. So yep. again, implicitly some elements may be contained, but the actual technical process would be that these items would be discussed again at a CPC session. Okay, well, hasn't helped, but thank you. Um, Councillor Woodward. Yeah, I'd like to speak to the, def to the deferral to subsequent CPC. So the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to discuss number one and uh, somewhat number two and number four in more depth before, before endorsing them. Like I have a number of issues that we don't have time to get into. Establish a draft carbon budget. Sounds great. For both corporate and community emissions. Well, I'd like to get that flushed out. I think the corporation versus the community we need to understand what that means in terms of endorsing the creation of a carbon budget to impose restrictions upon community emissions. That needs to be explored at the council, in my opinion, related to planning and land development. So now the carbon budget is only specific to planning and land development. Well, I don't like that. And a broader transportation analysis, I don't know what that means or what that entails or what that achieves, for which policies are aligned and limiting warning to one point side per specific safe limit. Is 1.5 unsafe, then maybe it should be lower. So I just wanted to flush this out rather and then work on it as a council, which I thought CPC is for, rather than endorsing specifically how this motion is worded, which heads off in a bunch of different directions that don't seem necessarily specific to a draft carbon budget. So that's why I wanted to discuss it further at a future CPC meeting rather than just voting against it. If the referral fails, I'll be voting against it, but it's not because I don't want to solve climate change. Thank you. Councillor Richter. 
I agree with Councillor Arneson. We need to get on with this. Uh, we've just passed a motion that it basically is authorizing staff to, to start moving forward and to start looking at budgeting uh, for the purposes of moving forward. Uh, to me, it seems quite logical that uh, these three items be included in their moving forward, and all Councillor Arneson is doing is suggesting that we make it clear to them that we want these topics addressed. So I'm not going to support the deferral. Councillor Whitmarsh. Uh, yeah, just a, a question through the chair to staff. When, when is our next uh, council priorities meeting or when would this show up? Our best estimate at this point would be probably May, June, given the current uh, uh, time frame, unless we were to bump or preempt something else. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the, uh, cons the uh, concern uh, by Councillor Arneson and uh, Councillor Richter uh, that, you know, we need to get on with this and get moving and so on. Uh, but I also do feel there's a number of questions that, that we need to uh, have answered in some more detail um, in addition to those that uh, Councillor uh, Woodward mentioned, um, I do think in the, in the fourth area it does talk about uh, you know doing some research into those things that are best practices. And and while today we did have uh, an introduction into some of the things that different communities have have adopted, um, I, I would like to uh, sort of uh, have a a recommendation from staff coming forward on what exactly are the things that they think we should adopt here in the township of Langley. Uh, those are great examples, and maybe some of those things would be good for Langley, uh, but there might be other things that we would like to do or other ways that we would like to move in Langley. And I, I think that would be helpful in number four to have that kind of conversation at the council table about what are the best uh, things for us, what kind of things do we really want to get at and, 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 and begin to adopt in the township. So, so I think having another uh, council priorities meeting, another discussion, if there's another place to do it that's better than CPC, I'm happy to do that. I don't want to slow it down, but... Um, you know, certainly the comments of us doing this for 20 and 30 years uh, uh, and, and not doing it or neglecting it for 20 or 30 years may be, may be in some cases adequate, even though we did hear that we've been doing this in the township since 2001. We've been addressing these and we're one of the leaders in the, in the area and in our local community. So, so I think another number of months as we really digest this and come up with the best strategies is the way to go forward. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of dealing with climate change, but we need to do it right and we need to have the best solution for Langley. Um, Councillor Long. Yeah, I do see a better place for this. I'm not going to really be too happy about waiting till next May and June because we've got a bit of a momentum going. So, I'm, uh, so on the floor right now is a referral of these. The motion has been made, seconded, and now it's being referred to as future CPC. So we'll have to ask uh, Madam Chair how would we would uh, handle my concept, which would be that it would be referred to staff for full report on these three items to come back to us for consideration when the other motion comes to council. And we can spend an hour at a council meeting sometime between now and, uh, and the end of the year, perhaps, or whenever this is, has, to, has to move forward, rather than waiting all the way to June to discuss it some more. So I, you know, I know that CPC is a good place to discuss it. it used to be a place that we would put things that we didn't want to discuss. We've all agreed we'd like to discuss this. I don't think we have to wait till May and June for another CPC. Why can't we discuss it when it comes back to council? To staff for a report on these three items? That, to refer, so that's a referral. So good luck, Madam Chair. How are you going to deal with that? <laughs> referral after referral. So we're we referring the referral, or are we making an amend amendment to the deferral? Okay, refer to Mr. Backen. Madam Chair, the, the challenge is we have a deferral motion that's setting out one course of action and a referral motion setting out another course of action. They may or may not be complementary depending upon the rule of the chair. Uh, you may be on the right track by suggesting that the deferral could be amended to be a referral if you feel that that is substantively uh, the same uh, matter. Uh, if you feel it's a different matter, we should dispose of the deferral first and then entertain the referral. I may need to just have a conversation with someone who can help me out here. Okay.
Councillor Richter, would you like to make an amendment to the deferral? Yes, I'd like to change it to a referral to the council meeting. Okay, so do we have a seconder? Do I need a seconder? Okay, oh, Councillor Long? Okay, Councillor Long. Okay. Okay, so new speakers list. We have Councillor Woodward. Yeah, so just to clarify now, we're, we're referring it to a regular council meeting or to staff for a report, which will show up on a regular council meeting, an afternoon meeting. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm supportive of that to make it happen faster. I'll reiterate again that, yeah, I don't, it's not my intent to have this come back in June. For me, I would be quite happy to schedule, uh, and, and, and would have, it's done now, but I didn't get a chance to do it further. I would have been quite happy to move to schedule a special meeting or a spe an, an additional CPC meeting on a Monday, which has not been scheduled, before the end of the year to discuss this item specifically, rather, because I think this format is better. We get more than one chance to, we don't get just two chances to speak. It is a bit more collaborative. It's a bit more casual. I don't necessarily want this to go to the more formalized structure, and maybe we can have a discussion before staff run off and report on a motion that we haven't even endorsed. So I, I would like to have that discussion. Maybe we can discuss the idea of a special CPC meeting. I don't believe CPC meets enough anyway. And the fact that this can't come back till June kind of proves that. So why don't we consider a special or an additional CPC meeting specifically on this topic rather than preempt other topics, um, rather than send this to a regular council meeting which formalizes it at this point. Thanks. Councillor, I mean, Mayor Froese. <laughs> Uh, there may be some difficulty in getting a CPC meeting prior to Christmas. I know uh, we have uh, a workshop coming up. Um, I'm sure people's agendas have already been been uh, filled up with other things on Mondays. Uh, we have a uh, budget coming up, but I think in the new year we certainly could do something, and I don't think the world will come to an end in the next two months. So maybe, Miss um, Bauer, is there some opportunity in the new year, uh, or not rather than June, but sometime early in the new year? I don't think we'll get this done before Christmas. I mean, my calendar is full. Everybody else's calendar is full, and we have other items on, on uh, CPC. Um, having looked at the calendar for the end of November, December, it would be very, very difficult. Um, but we could definitely try and schedule something for June or January. Pardon okay, me. let's let's work on that. So I think um, I, I agree that um, I think a referral to staff, basically for a report, is basically going back to the original motion. I, I think that's really what we're trying to do. The deferral for is get a more fulsome discussion. So I'm not going to support this amendment, but I will support the the. Um, referral to the CPC and and I'll, myself and staff will endeavor to have this uh, as soon as possible in the nears where we can collaborate with everyone's calendars thank you I hate to venture in but there is the opportunity for Councillor Woodward to make an amendment to the amendment we're allowed two amendments so that may be what he was intending or he may not have been I'm just yeah, pointing I'm really happy to work with others and see what they're saying but I'd be fine I would like it embedded into the motion that it occurs early in the new year that's flexible enough and make that amendment if we all adopt that by unanimous consent madam chair show of hands oh, right. Right. Oh. No, nobody objects so okay well then we'll vote on yeah. it then <laughs> okay so okay I need to dispose of that. Okay, so I got to dispose of the amendment that's on the floor. Bishop, usually true. However, you can have a second amendment if the chair rules is substantively the same. And I would suggest that because of the first ruling, it would be substantively the same. So this would be, first of all, a further amendment that this matter be um, deferred uh, to a special CPC meeting early in the new year and likely in January. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so we have uh, Councillor Woodward moved it, um, Mayor Fro seconded it. Uh, do we have a show of hands here if we want to call the vote? All in favor? Okay, the amendment to the amendment to have a CPC meeting in January or closest, as close as we can. Yes, show of hands. All in favor? Opposed. Opposed. Okay. Then the next step is to call the question on the um, mo the amendment as amended. So can I will call the question to the am can I have amendment that on the amendment? Read back, please, Madam Chair. 
Yes. yes. So the amendment was originally that this matter be referred to staff for a report. Uh, that was the first amendment. We've had an amendment to that amendment that we actually have a CPC meeting in early in the new year. Um, so now that we've passed the amendment to the amendment, we still have the amendment to the main motion to be passed. So the question is, usually it'd be the same party supporting the amendment and then we'll call the motion as amended. So I'd like to call the motion as amended. No? no. Call the amendment to the amendment. Okay, call sorry, you want to call the amended motion. Sorry, I've confused that. You want to call the motion as amended. Okay, so the motion as amended. Oh, we have some discussion. No? no. no. Okay. All right, show of hands. All in favor? Opposed. Opposed. Okay, um, is that, that's done. So um, motion to adjourn. Terminate. Terminate. <laughs> Terminate. <laughs> I'll get the language one of these days. Oh, do